today we have an awesome guest, the creator of Baggage Claim. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Mark. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Of course. I love your channel and I find it so refreshing. And on Baggage Claim, you talk about cultural issues, but you take a really nice philosophical approach to them. And, you know, it's so confusing. We live in such a time of chaos. And to hear your take has been just refreshing is the word that comes to mind. Thank you so much. And I feel the same way about after school. I absolutely love your channel, consume everything. And I've been very inspired by how you you have these takes where you'll draw really good parallels without actually mentioning the particular issues that you're talking about. And I think in that way, you make your videos so timeless and universal. So that's actually really been inspiring me to, to be better at doing that. Oh, well, thank you. That means a lot, especially coming from you, a great creator. So yeah, before we, this video will come out right after our collaboration comes out. So we can talk about that. But first, I'd love to hear about just what, what were you doing before you started your channel? Sure. I, for a better part of a decade, I've been working in the startup space. And so doing something completely else, that's not really where I started. I started off as an accountant and then uh, slowly got entered into startups. I was inspired by my brother to move up to the Bay Area. I used to live in Los Angeles before that and then moved to the Bay Area and um, really enjoyed that aspect of sort of learning on the job. You know, at a startup, you kind of wear multiple hats, you have to do whatever it takes. So I learned a lot, but I kept kind of missing something. I kept feeling like, there was a part of me that just kind of realized that I was not really meant for the job in a lot of ways. I'm, um, I wasn't really enjoying it. It felt very forced. I was kind of forcing myself into this particular mold of being this big exec. I had this, you know, big dreams of, of that I was going to be this big executive. And the more I got into it, the more unhappy I became. And so I finally sort of got to that point, I think around the 30 mark, I've heard a lot of people share similar stories where you stop trying to force yourself into being something. You finally just acknowledge what you are and what you could be if you stop trying to force things. And um, I just reached that point and I said, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I was fantasizing about YouTube videos. I was thinking a lot about, uh, about uh, you know, I was thinking in video essay form. And I said, okay, I think it's time. I think it's time to, to leave all that. And it was a good time because 2020 happened, you know, all the madness that happened with 2020. And it was a good time to take a pause and step back because everybody was kind of separated out anyway. So there wasn't enough distraction of the world. Um, and that's when I came up with the concept of baggage claim. And uh, it I was motivated by wanting to talk about uh, issues, personal issues, professional issues, psychological issues that people might have on an individual level, all, but also culturally, what are things that we can't sort of see eye to eye on? And how, where can we meet in the middle? Because things were becoming more and more polarized, more and people were getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And um, being in, you know, I'm, I'm based in San Francisco. So being in San Francisco, things just over the last 10 years just became so polarized. And my opinions that I thought were perfectly acceptable before were suddenly uh, you, completely being ostracized, especially I, I had to be really, really quiet in professional settings or people were making assumptions about how I think politically just based on the color of my skin or my gender. And so I found those instances very strange. And I said, this is this this can't be the future of our society. We have to be headed in a better place. And so and that's what really inspired me to to start thinking about about what I could be contributing to that conversation. Mm, so you basically got so uncomfortable in that startup environment that it, it pushed you to express your creativity. Yes. That story really resonates with me because I, I have I had a similar thing where you feel like you're just a cog in a machine and you, you feel like you're not being able to be creative and that's kind of what people are put on earth to do is be creative. And if you're yes. not doing that, you, you just, you feel completely inauthentic and it's almost like you have a psychological death. Mm, and, absolutely. Uh, so now are you doing a baggage claim full time? 
Yes, full time. And what you just, you know, what you said, I also found that so much of my work, because I never really thought of myself as a very creative person, um, even though I used to write a lot of stories when I was a kid, I just didn't think of myself like that. And my role just became sort of babysitting a lot of people, making sure that they did their job. That kind of became my everyday job was, hey, can you make sure that people meet their deadlines? And I found that to be such a strange idea that pe there was no self-governance for a lot of people and they would find reasons to justify not getting their work done. And and I was just going around chasing things down and, and people are, people were very kind about, you know, pushing this narrative that I'm, oh, I'm the woman who gets shit done. You know, that was kind of the tagline under my Slack was, you know, she gets shit done. And and yet I found, well, why why am I doing that? Is that really helping people at the end of the day? Is that actually contributing anything positive? I just felt like a, I just felt kind of like a fetcher of sorts. So, you know, it's it's what you're saying. It's that psychological death because you're actually not being as productive as you could be. Well, you are definitely getting shit done on your channel. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I've been really hyper-focused on the issues that you talk about on your channel because um, movies in particular seem to be at the center of the culture war now. Yes. And it seems like our, our modern movies have been overtaken by some sort of rot within. And uh, I've, I've been really into channels like uh, Critical Drinker and Nerd Rotic and your channel. Um, and I'm curious to know, like your answer is just, why are modern movies failing to connect with audiences? I think, honestly, analyzing that question ends up answering a bigger question around what's wrong with society in general. Um, and it could be perfectly summed up with, we are caught up in this pursuit of the overly simplistic approach. I think if you think about the appeal of going the simple route is because it's possible today because of the advent of social media. So if I have a particular opinion if I take it online, I could put that out there and immediately get likes, whatever that opinion might be. So I can build up a reputation pretty easily by minimal effort and just say things that are particularly popular or, you know, rile people up, whatever, whatever my, my base level goal might be. And that sort of, that sort of thinking has really translated into movie making because to make a good movie, it takes a lot of work. It takes so much effort. And this is something Chris Gore talks, talked about. He and I were you know, messaging back and forth about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and someone who wrote for his, for his website, Film Threat, um, talked about that there's this perception that movie making is actually really simple and anyone can do it. And it, there's like a form of jealousy, but also this marginalization of the effort. And there's not that realization that to put something together that's a good narrative, you know, good structure, good, a good heart to it, good dialogue even, takes a lot of thought, takes a lot of experience, um, a lot of consternation, a lot of collaboration to come up with something like that. And that's not really the approach that modern um, writers that have gotten into these writer rooms because they meet certain diversity criteria. They don't think like that. And a lot of the identity politics is rooted around that belief that ability is not really, is not really something that can be achieved through effort. Ability is inherent to your experience or you know, you're the color of your skin. So for example, and I was talking about this on Nerdrotic's channel last week, that there's that belief that a woman who checks certain boxes has something really unique to say. Because if you, I don't know if you know, but Disney released a new, cha a new TV show called Echo. And it's, it, it hits, it's like the intersectional gold mine, so to speak, because the main character, Maya, is a woman, she's indigenous, she's deaf, and she is an amputee. So she just hits so many, you know, checked boxes that uh, 
all the people have to sort of step back and bow down and say, you know, this woman's going to offer us an, an understanding that's going to be so unique that nobody's ever, you know, could could even perceive what she might have to say or if she, you know, if she can't speak, but represent. And that is just such a falsehood of, of belief that we are all so individually unique. It's that idea of saying like everybody's special and such a, and everybody has such a unique thing to do. The thing is, everybody has value to add, but we are a lot more similar than we are different. And what makes a story good is when it speaks to universal truths that it hit close to home, that can actually, you know, they, they actually get to your heart, not because you look a certain way or you, you, you have a certain background, but it's because of the universal human experience. And this past weekend when i was watching i was watching uh the behind the scenes for for lord of the rings which is the greatest trilogy of all time created of all time and i love watching the behind the scenes more than even sometimes watching the movie i like watching the behind the scenes because it, it shows you the herculean effort that a lot of people put for better part of 10 years and if you look at the entire sort of like vast variety of like production and cast from top to bottom, everybody poured their soul into that, that piece of work. And I love seeing that because that's what t art takes. As you know, you know, that's what art takes is that it takes almost everything out of you for you to create something beautiful, something that a lot of people can identify with. And I don't mean identify in the identity perspective, I mean from the humanist experience perspective. And you see that, that, you know, Peter Jackson set the tone as the main push behind that whole project. And everyone followed suit, all the production people, all the artists, you know, they even thought about the, the cultural significance of what it means to be uh, from Rohan and how significant horses would be and where, you know, farmland would be placed. They thought about all those little details versus what would it be like for Gondor. I mean, that's how, how much that they really put, put thought into that. And it showed, even if you didn't catch every little detail, it showed in the project as a whole. And it transformed all of their lives. The art and their their willingness to engage with that art transformed their lives, but it transformed so many millions and millions of people watch that and continue and will continue forever to watch that and be transformed for, by it. And I don't enjoy that movie or that story because there's, you know, a brown girl who happens to be Indian and an immigrant and is you know, has has black hair and is nearsighted is in that movie. What value does that add to me? You know, and it's a very that's a very narcissistic perspective to say, I need the hero that's accomplishing great things to look just like me. That's a, such a that's such a surface level way to engage with a movie. But that's what modern movie makers really expect. And what is that? It comes back to that same idea. That's the easy thing to do and say, you should enjoy this movie because the the heroine looks like you and that's what the entire promotion for echo was exactly that it was our main character is deaf our main character is deaf is she's indigenous she's this she's body positive she's this it's just all these little things that are so easy to do is the main promotion of that tv sh uh, of that tv show but the actual value that's, that someone might be able to get to see a story that transcends time, that transcends space, but speaks to that human experience of what does it take to do something really hard? Lord of the Rings, what does it take to do a really difficult task? And what, how does it change you? How does it, how does it, how, what does it mean to go up against evil? And how can it, that evil touch your heart and almost destroy you, almost kill you in that process? I mean, that's the human story that a lot of people connect with. And so I think that's really the problem is that there's not that willingness to do the hard thing because there's a lack of recognition that, that it's even worth the doing. It's like, just take the easy route, just go for representation. And that's, the, and, and there's a whole group of people that are reinforcing that perspective 
amongst those writer rooms. Wow, you just said it all. You just hit so <laughs> many different things that I want to talk about. Um, and I think at the core of it, the, the writing is, is really fallen off a cliff. And yes. they don't have anything new to say. They're not telling any new stories. They're not speaking to these universal truths. And perhaps that's why they're so focused on these materialistic identity things. Mm. Because if you take that identity aspect away from it, what is it? It's just an empty, just, there's nothing behind that. Yeah. So perhaps that's why they are pushing that so hard because that's the only new thing they're bringing to the table. Otherwise, that's it's why. like, well, why are you making this movie that nobody asked for? We're making it because the genitalia of the new care of the main character is different. That's why we have to remake this three hundred million dollar movie. And it's like, okay, I, I guess if it's that important to you, I guess it's worth remaking. Hmm. But I love that you spoke about Lord of the Rings because that's my favorite movie by far. And I, I think I've literally watched that same behind the scenes video. And I can't watch Lord of the Rings without pointing out, like, you don't want to watch Lord of the Rings with me because I'm going to be like, <laughs> Viggo Mortensen broke his foot in this yeah. scene. You know, he broke his toe. And <laughs> that's the first and, thing I thought yeah. of. I was like, oh, you know, I think the same thing. Yeah. Like, did you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm the same way. Lord of the Rings is, is so deep and so good. It's such a, it's a symmetrical story. You have like nine members of the fellowship and then you have these nine Nazgul who are mm. like the shadow side of them chasing mm. them and then you have the good wizard and then you have the dark wizard mm. and then you have like elves and dwarves that contradict each other and then the Urukai, the orcs are like literally dark elves they are like dug up from the earth and they are elves so it's like it's almost like a perfect symmetrical psychological mind the story it's like there's a dark side and there's a light side yeah. And without the dark side, what is the Shire? The, mm. the Shire is like nothing without the dark side. But because the dark is so dark in that story, the good is so good. Mm. You know, that the anti-hero defines the heroes. And um, I never so thought anyways, about it I could that go way. on for Lord of the Rings. Huh? I never thought about it that way. I never thought about the symmetry. That's very interesting. That's and so true. I, ne I never looked at it that way. R really good stories have great symmetry. Like I, I've, I've been rewatching Breaking Bad. Mm. And that story is very similar because Walter White is sick and he's kind of dying. He's on his way out. But at the same time, his wife is pregnant. She's bringing life in. So you have this mm. nice symmetry to the story. You have his son in the above world, which is the his son with his wife. And then he has his son in the dark world, which is Jesse. Oh, it's um, That's so true. And then every character in the dark world has good qualities and every character in the above world has these mm. dark qualities like his sister-in-law steals you know everybody does these like things that you're like wait maybe they're not so good maybe all the good mm. people aren't so good and he's got this like shadow side that he taps into right. and whenever he does that you're like yes come on walter <laughs> Anyways, wow i i didn't i never looked at it that's it that's that's the thing i'm you know i that's that's amazing i love that i can see why then you appreciate these things even more, you know, seeing the deep layers of everything. Yes. And, and like you were saying with, with modern movies, there, there isn't really much thought to like the symmetry. It's very one dimensional. Like you see a white guy on the screen and you're like, okay, he's the bad guy. Hmm. All right. And you don't get much more depth to that. No, so. no, you don't. And the, um, what you were saying, you know, you can see with the writing the, around the laziness of everything, you know, taking the easy route for everything. And um, one of the things that I hate that that's kind of come along with is the amount of cursing in, in every, every single um, script. Because so, you know, there are some comedians that will say, you know, I'm going to work clean. Like Will Smith is one of them. He, he always said that he was going to work clean. I, Obviously, he broke that cursing like crazy during the Oscar night. Um, but he's he's always been one of those people who says, like, I'm not going to curse. And and I think with cursing, it's very easy to convey anger by just using certain four letter words. Um, it takes a lot of effort to convey it otherwise. And I think that's, again, one of those things that really bothers me about like every now, you know, new TV show has cursing in it rather than actually working with the language, the English language to create, 
create dialogue that's engaging and interesting and like gives you full nuance of someone's character and feelings without having to rely on something like that which is what, what was nice about network tv in the past is that that's what it kind of demanded it said you can't curse so a lot of people with that limitation had to make sure that they were going to be really good at, at, at their mastery of the english language and that's now without that limitation people just kind of go with the you know lowest denominator again i know that i sound like such a such a you know fuddy-duddy saying stuff like that but i i just really want to defend the english language <laughs> Well, I, I completely agree with you because if you don't have a lot of cursing, when you do have cursing, it, it really has weight to it. Mm. But I, I have seen that where there's certain shows where they're saying the F word in every other sentence and it's mm. kind of like, it just becomes a filler word. Yes. Kind of like the word like. You know? uh, yeah, it's in succession. That's one of the reasons I couldn't get into succession is that every other word was the F word. And uh, what I liked about... Um, what was interesting about Sex in the City was that there's a, I mean, gratuitous amount of, uh, you know, sex scenes and nudity and all this stuff. But when it came to Sarah Jessica Parker's character, one of the things she said when they started working on that, she said, I know it's HBO and we can do anything, but I feel like my character being a writer should not be cursing all the time. That when she does curse, like you're saying, it adds that weight to it because that's the point is that she's a writer. She's, she should be good at communicating her emotions without having to devolve to that or resolve to that. Resort, sorry, that's the word I was trying to think of. And so what those times that she would say, you know what, F him, that like hit really hard because that's, that was atypical for her to say something like that. You, you know, I, I am a big fan of that show. You are? And it has, and like you were saying before, um, it has universal truths. So you don't have to look exactly like the people in the show to get it. Right. And the swearing aspect, I remember the first episode of that show had the best writing of any show I've ever seen. Hmm. Because she asked Mr. Big, have you ever been in love? And he says, absolutely. fucking lutely Yeah. And you, you're like, okay, this is not going to be a traditional romance show because he just swore hmm. while talking about something that's very traditionally romantic, but he just swore. So this is not going to be that type of story. Right. So <laughs> I could go on on that show as well. Yeah, the writing for that show is really good. It is incredibly good. As good as that writing is, it's exactly the opposite when it comes to the reboot. And just like that is so poorly written. You yeah, can just I, see... I couldn't watch you, those. Yeah, you can just see sort of the evolution of... of writer rooms just from that because I, I think it's a lot of the same people still involved but you can just see how the situation has really changed and and talent has sort of devolved yeah yeah well i think that show got consumed by identity politics as well yes didn't it? yes i mean mr big technically is canceled forget chris noth the actor who plays mr big but mr big the idea of mr big is unacceptable in in today's world because you know, he's he he is what he represented everything that was emblematic of New York in the 90s, right? Extremely kind of bigger, larger than life, uh, you know, uh, very masculine, very sort of has his own way to everything, very intrans intransigent, uh, and extremely uh, rich, which is like what the whole show is about. The whole show is about consumerism you know essentially it's about shoes it's about all the best clothing i mean that was so much about it but also about trying to find love at a time where new york was kind of past love right past romance and so it's it's interesting because now they're trying to kind of you know they they participated in all that and now they're trying to prove that they've evolved beyond all of it and, uh, you know, think that by killing off of a, a character, an iconic character, they can kind of claim moral high ground. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that there's been a decline of, of romance mm. in media and just in general. Um, you can even look at like statistics with Gen Z. Yes. There's less romance, less children. Mm. Um, yeah, what, what do you think that's about, less romance? I think 
so this is this is actually kind of perfect to talk about because I've been uh, neck deep in this feminist video that I seem to be working on forever. I started writing it in December and I'm finally, I think, almost done with the editing. And uh, what, as part of that, so what, the question I've been trying to answer is like, how has feminism helped our society and how has it hurt it? Because I, I think we tend to take at least out in the open, people tend to take a very sort of polarized view on everything. Oh, feminism sucks or feminism is great. What about the middle ground is kind of what I wanted to dive into. And so as part of that, I've read a lot of the writings of, of feminist thinkers, you know, across the 20th century. And the one that I found that I found to be the strangest was this woman called uh, Firest uh, Shulamith Firestone. And she uh, you know, passed away recently in 2012. She, but in in the 1970s, she was quite active, and she wrote this book called *The Dialectic of Sex*. And in that, she laid out what fu the future needed to look like. Excuse me. Needed to look like in order for it to actually be fair for men and women. And she was building on a lot of the ideas that previous um, previous feminists had had come out with. But there were a couple of points that she made, and one of them was around um, around men and women just being indistinguishable uh, physically, that they should be indistinguishable, that you should not be able to tell um, the difference, and that women should not be responsible for bearing children uh, because of the pain and anguish attached to that, and that um, children should be born in pods, little little you know pods outside of women's bodies. And that children should not even be raised by their genetic parents. Um, so, and that and that the nuclear family should be eradicated. So there are all these like, ideas, and this was co pretty consistent with sort of other thinkers. Yes, she pushed it even further uh, by saying that women, sh you know, should not bear children. Period. But there were a lot of feminist thinkers before her, uh, starting from the 60s, that were suggesting that women should not engage in, in sort of motherhood and family and in relationships with men, that that was the ultimate uh, feminist move, was to just reject any sort of relationship with men. And many of them suggested then, okay, well, how do you fix loneliness? So it's like, oh, engage in lesbianism is, was sort of the answer. Um, so. It's that whole idea that women are so much happier without men and, and men are just useless and get rid of them. And, you know, they're just responsible for the patriarchy and and uh, up, upend the whole 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 board by not even engaging with them. So I think that sort of thinking has been making its way and trickling into various parts of of sort of the teachings that that, you know, children go through when they go go through college, that they, they get indoctrinated with this idea that it's men and it's women and we're against each other and you know there can be only one winner you know you don't need to engage with the other side you don't need to compromise you don't need to find a way to work together you don't need to build partnerships with the other other sex it's just you know it's going to be one winner and it's going to be women and i think as part of that then you're seeing those types of thinkers you know the 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 sort of disciples of those that sort of thinking then entering writers rooms so any sort of modern writing is not about romance at all it's actually about domination so captain marvel has no love interest her only marriage is because you know she's um she's i think made a political alliance or something in the in the new marvel movie i don't know if you saw that the marvels and yeah, oh, you probably uh, saved no. yourself some time, time and money. Yeah, I, I couldn't do it. There was a, 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 an extra scene. I don't know why I'm forgetting the word. But a deleted scene. There you go. That uh, Nerd Roddick showed on his channel. And uh, in the deleted scene, there was this like very inappropriate lesbian joke made by one character to another who's underage. So it's very obvious that that all of that sort of perspective on just cut men out is very strong within the writers and they're just trying to insert it anywhere possible. And so it's old fashioned to be in love with a man and want to 
form a good par partnership with him. It's old-fashioned. It's anti-feminist to do that. It's anti-woman to do that. And you see that even uh, surface up with that uh, Rachel Zegler interview where she says, um, you know, there's a big focus on her love story. And she's so sarcastic about it. She's so irritated about it, despite she herself having a boyfriend that she often talks about in references. Uh, and she talks about how the prince could be completely cut from the story, right? It's, it's for, who cares about love when there's power to be had, right? And that's one of those things that's very interesting is that that's what feminists think of the patriarchy, that the patriarchy only cares about power and they don't care about love. Um, and that's their, that's the very, I think very, you know, we can dive into the patriarchy whenever, but that's a very simple, overly simplistic, uh, ex understanding of how men think. And so that's, this is their counteraction to that and saying love is a distraction. Love requires compromise. It requires, uh, sacrifice. Um, so why would an individual do that? Especially if we're pushing for a very self first perspective and philosophy in life. So instead we, we should say F love, we should go and seek power and leadership. Yikes. Well, it, <laughs> it seems like the actions are driven entirely by resentment. Hmm. You know, there's yes. no, I've heard that you're, you're either driven by gratitude or by resentment. And I think it's very clear that the people creating these movies are driven by resentment. Now mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like all about what power do they lack or, you know, how have they been wronged? And it all stems from, to me, it all stems from narcissism because there's two types of narcissism. There's the, the form where you think everybody's better than you. So you are entitled to what they have. You, you need to be leveled out or you believe that you are better than everybody else and you're entitled as well. Like both, both views lead to entitlement and that you're better than, you know, that you come first. Yeah. And so you see that in, in the way that the characters in these movies behave. It's this resentful narcissism. Mm. And I don't think it's really connecting with audiences anymore because if you're looking at the numbers, it's been like flop after flop after flop with these huge budget films. So they're going to either have to correct their mistakes or they're just going to, they're going to not be able to sustain this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I think they're going to keep going for some time because the thing is wokeness and I know we'll, 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 we'll touch on some of this stuff of how it's kind of sort of infected companies and cities later, but wokeness is, is such a, such an infection in that once it enters certain environments, it's very hard to argue against. It's very hard to overthrow and because it's very easy for people who are willing to play that woke game. It's very easy for them to destroy other people's reputations by casting aspersions on their character and calling them racist and bigoted. And, and those sorts of, those, those sorts of terms really stick, you know, you, you say that enough, enough people say it, um, you know, it, it's very destructive on an individual level. So why would someone sort of stand up to that? And so you just need one or two bad actors from, from a wokeness side to kind of overthrow an entire organization. It's really not that, not that hard because we live in a polite society. We don't want to offend. Uh, we're not brutes. So it's almost like the strengths, the greatest strengths of Western society are getting turned on itself, so to speak. And everything you're saying about the resentment aspect of it, you know, I think one of the best stories ever written is Groundhog Day. And I don't know if you've watched that movie. Have you? I have to now. You, you and I, I think you'll really, it. I think you'll really enjoy it. And I, you know, without giving, well, you can, I kind of don't do, want to give it away. I'll still watch it. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to ruin the experience for you, but it's not, I mean, I think you can anticipate what the movie might be about the second you start watching it. But the, what's great about that movie is, first of all, the premise is that this man is waking up and reliving the same day over and over. So you must have heard that part uh, because it's, some, it's like a fun trope that he's literally replaying Groundhog Day every day and he has no idea why. 
And when you meet the character, his name is Phil and, you know, played really well by uh, Um, Murray, right? Yes. Okay. I'm so glad you remembered his name. Uh, And he, you know, played so well by him. And when you meet him, he is this very resentful, sort of narcissistic, um, self-aggrandizing type character. And he's full of loathing. He, I mean, for everything, for life, for the world, for people around him, his colleagues, uh, his job, everything. And so you see him live two particular days before the repeating starts. And when you see the second day that he lives, the one day that he keeps repeating over and over, you realize it's actually a really shitty day that he ends up living, where he wakes up, he's, you know, he's here in this town, he's reporting on Groundhog Day, and he wakes up, he's at, at, an, at a B&B, it's a cold day, he's rude to the person he meets outside of his room, he mocks him, he goes downstairs, he's rude to the uh, B&B owner, you know, she doesn't know what espresso is, and he mocks her for that. He, he walks out, he sees some old man and he's, who's asking for money and he kind of mocks him as well. He tries to avoid this insurance salesman that he runs into who's an old, old student from his own, own school. He ends up get, walking into a puddle, like a really cold, wet puddle. And like, he's just having this terrible day and he comes, he gets to his job, he reports on it. Again, he's like sarcastically reporting on this job and, and you see him play out this whole day and it's like what what entity forced him to relive this day every like for possibly years like people estimate that that day he lived for maybe 10 years over and over is what people think like it's like thousands and thousands of times he's waking up but it's it's that we experience his experience, we experience his life for that one sliver of a day, but you can make that assumption that that's how he was living every single day of his life leading up to that. And the movie, as it evolves, forces him to rethink some things because there's just no, out of sh- sheer you know, lack of choice. And suddenly he switches his perspective from being sort of the supercilious person or even hedonistic person to suddenly he's like, let me see if I can help people because I'm here and I see what they're up to. And suddenly he just starts helping people. He helps the old man that he comes across. He makes sure that he's warm and fed. And he goes to, uh, he realizes that one kid across the block like broke his leg. So he, every time, you know, he's about to break his leg every day, he's, he saves him and prevents him from breaking his leg or like some old women get a flat tire and he goes and spends time on that and that's just him helping people around the town but he starts learning how to play the piano and he starts learning how to ice sculpt and like he starts reading french poetry and there are all these little things he starts engaging in and then as a as a result it actually completely changes his perspective on life and you so you see from in the beginning he lives this terrible terrible day to suddenly the last day you see he lives this wondrous day where he goes around ridding everybody of their misery and you realize that nothing has changed it's not it's like the day is exactly the same life is exactly the same it's his perspective has changed his effort into his life has changed his his, how he thinks about other people has changed and he went from living this resentful terrible life to actually a very fulfilling thoughtful life where he's looked at by other people and respected by other people whereas before people couldn't give a, a damn about him and the the person who wrote this and the directors they both said that they received so many letters from across the globe saying this is the perfect buddhist movie this is the perfect hindu movie this is the perfect jewish movie this is the perfect you know christian movie because they were talking about like what lessons that this this movie was espousing and the reality is it's actually the perfect it's perfect universally because it conveys that basic idea that nothing you do in life is under your uh, sorry life in general what happens to you is mostly not under your control 
It's what you, how you choose to engage with life that's really important. And that idea is so universal that people across the globe are writing to him and saying, this really spoke to me, you know, this completely connected with me and thank you. And, and, and that's the point. That's what makes a good story. And that's what makes a story transcend time is if it, if it gets to the core of like actually solving a very important question, which is how do you find a way to live a really good life despite the endless miseries of life, but also why then exploring why resentment is so attractive to, to a lot of people. And everybody goes through that, right? You could be the most optimistic person possible. And I, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. But for the last four years, I had a very trying time. There were a lot of things that were happening in my life personally, including health issues and like family issues and all this stuff that it, I could see the door. I could see the door open for me to walk through and become this very resentful person. It's like that there's always that attraction, but it takes that it takes work to stay on the optimistic side. And that at the end of the day, it just benefits you. You live a better life. If you engage with an optimistic perspective versus, a, you know, a resentful sort of angry one. Wow, that's a beautiful analogy. And I have so many thoughts. And the, the saying I say all the time is fate is what you are given. Destiny is what you make of it. Mm, and I like that. I think that speaks to two things are true at the same time. You are a product of your environment but your environment is also a product of you. So when people get drawn towards that victim mindset, it's so attractive because it says, hey, nothing's your fault. You're just a product of your environment. You didn't pick your genes or your parents or where you were born. So none of this is your fault. And you're like, yes, thank you. That, that is true. And it is true. But what is also true at the same time is your environment is a product of, of you. So you can enact free will and create the situation that you want to make it. And it all starts within your own mind. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of why we watched that movie Groundhog Day in the first place. Because if it was just him reliving the same day every day and there was no evolution of his mindset, why would we even watch it? That's right. kind of why we watch movies is to see this hero's journey play out. You know, they start in this resentful bitter place like Thor or something. Hmm. And then they have to learn this important lesson and they come out on the other side, this evolved, enlightened being. Hmm. And I think that's what modern movies are missing so much is the characters don't develop. And in so many of the scenes, nothing is lost and nothing's gained. And you're kind of like sitting there, why did I even watch this? Because it's almost like the producer said, we need one more battle scene here. And they just inserted it after the movie was already made. And, but, you know, nobody can die and nobody can get hurt because so, it can't in, impact the later scene. Whereas you think of a, a good movie, Lord of the Rings, every single battle, every line, every interaction, something is lost and something is gained. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, everything has weight to it. Everything becomes important. So, yeah, that's, that's why we tune into these things to see that evolution. Yeah. Just a, yeah thought on what you said absolutely absolutely agree with you there's no there's yeah there's there are no stakes and that's what's interesting about echo is that not only are, are there no stakes there are also no morals you know she wants she wants to replace the crime boss that she used to work for she's this assassin and she you know she realizes that this man kind of betrayed her so she goes and you know shoots him in the face and now she wants to be you know run the ring herself and there's no recognition that she's gone around killing people there are no consequences for that you know there is no atonement for that she's not really a hero um she's only so because you're being told that she is so there's no actual morality attached to it so that and that's the other thing is that there's no sort of that everything's sort of um murky on that side as well well yeah that's that's also a sign of good story writing because the line between good and evil is not very simple mm. you know you can't just put all the oppressors on one side and all the oppressed on the other mm. um the famous writer alexander solzhenitsyn I'm saying his name wrong but he was the 
Russian writer that was in a gulag, he famously said that the line between good and evil runs between every human heart. And this was very profound for him to say because he was at the mercy of these communist soldiers in a gulag. And he was able to even see the humanity in them. And he was able to see that people that were right next to him in the camps were also had evil qualities. So it's like everybody, you, with just a few different tweaks of your circumstances, you could end up being that soldier at the gulag, or you could be a, the prisoner, you know? Yeah. It's not clear who's good and who's bad. Right. And I think, um, I think there was a lot of black and white perspective on, on, you know, that could be achieved on, on the war when it came to world war two, because of, of this like mass imprisonment that happened of people, but everything that's happened geopolitically since is so nuanced that people crave, but people crave that black and white perspective. It's that they, they don't want it, you know, and I, I do too. I'm not, I'm not pinning it just on other people. I too wish that I could just say that person's evil and, you know, our country is great. And, and then that way I can just connect with our co country's um, national identity and never have to question it, you know, and I can just feel safe in the national identity, but everything is so murky but people are often looking for that is that who's the bad guy and i want to be part of the good guys and and just leave it at that mm, very true i think there was a point in american history where we did think that we were the good guys and we were mm -hmm. absolutely sure of that probably yeah. after world war ii we were patting ourselves on the back but i think around vietnam is when we realized actually we might be the bad guys mm. and i think a lot of that american innocence was ripped away in yes. the 60s Yes. And I think one of the things that makes me really sad is it, it, it was really interesting to watch uh, Robert uh, F. Kennedy Jr.'s uh, podcast. If you haven't watched um, his talk, by the way, on Joe Rogan and Lex Friedman, just incredible. And he talks a lot about his father and his uncle and their assassinations. And but also how his father and his uncle really helped prevent the war escalation, the Cold War escalation with uh, with Russia and the whole sort of machine, kind of what Eisenhower warned us about, the the complex industry, uh, the Mil military industrial complex. Yes, there you go. Uh, and the obsession with with another starting another war that there was this whole machine trying to manipulate JFK into going to war um, and both RFK and JFK sort of coalesced and decided to try to de-escalate it by just connecting with Gorbachev directly. And I think uh, RFK ended up writing a, a letter to Gorbachev and talking about the importance of a future for their children. And Gorbachev, being a father himself, really connected with that. And RF, uh, RFK Jr. tells the story much better than I, I could do it justice. But what I found really sad about that is that here were two men that were thinking about rather than their legacy, because they could have thought from the perspective of, you know, being those presidents that are waging into war and, and, you know, recognized as heroes and vanquishing the enemy, so to speak, and just cementing their legacy accordingly. And all they could think about instead was, you know, the people that, you know, millions of Russians will die, millions of Americans will die, and that that's more important than any individual's legacy. And knowing that these two men couldn't be sort of bamboozled into going into war, and there were many attempts made to convince our JFK to send troops to Vietnam. That was actually what RFK Jr. talked about, that his, his uncle was really resisting starting a war with Vietnam, and that that's when the assassination happened. You know, and after that, LBJ, the, the vice president, got promoted, and very quickly we went into Vietnam. So you have to wonder sort of around that. I'm not making broad statements there, but you just have to kind of wonder what exactly was going on there. But that's so sad that, you know, these men looked at someone like JFK, who was essentially in that context, the best man among them, who was willing to think about greater good than, than, their, than his own selfish desires. And they decided to get together and, and you know, maybe get him out of the job. So that 
and it, that's what happens, right? You, it takes one man to stand up to something like that, to prevent something bad like that. But that's, that's what moral de degradation looks like, is that when good men are unable to, to do anything, to stop it, right? You're all, you have a room of, of like smoky cigars, just driving, you know, very sort of like selfish desires forward versus thinking about the bigger picture of things. Yeah, well, it, it seems like we're at a point where the actions of our country, especially abroad globally, don't seem to be in the best interest of the vast majority of citizens in America. Hmm. It seems to be serving this very small elite group who is like this puppeteer hmm. pulling the strings. And we're sitting here like nobody really wants to go to war. I haven't really met a single person that was just like gung ho about going to war hmm. and it doesn't seem like we're getting much out of it and but we're sending all these resources to other countries to keep this going yet when a tragedy happens in america like in hawaii the citizens in hawaii are kind of left needing help and yeah. you know they're american citizens where's their help well it's not really in the interest of these puppeteers so you know they don't really get much from helping the, the Hawaiian citizen. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think this yeah. is where the self-governance aspect has really fallen apart in society. Like if you have to, if we have to wonder, you know, what exactly is wrong with everything that's going on? It's, it's the, it's the fall of self-governance because laws and even constitutions, they don't, they don't actually implement anything. They, you know, they, they set the tone, but it's like it's it's an agreement that the individuals have to maintain it, right? Uh, so what ends up maintaining a good society is culture, and what ends up maintaining a good culture is self governance and how much an individual is willing to do the right thing, and so the culture reinforces that, and then the individual reinforces the culture, and this is you know the 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 common nietzsche line is that we have we have killed god right and and he predicted all the things that were to come that ha have happened in the 20th century and i think that's where we're really languishing as a society is that we don't know what to do with ourselves post god and we're seeing we're, we're very we're very quick to reject the idea of god and and say, oh, that's such an antiquated idea of some man in the sky, kind of like cartoonish perspective on God. But once we've destroyed him, we've actually replaced him with ourselves. And that's a terrible, on a, on a human level, that's actually terrible for us. We, we should not think of ourselves on an individual level as the most sort of the, the highest being to kind of abide by. That what you do alone when no one is looking your your selfish mind will say that's fine you can do whatever you want if you have a relationship with a higher power you would say no what's the right thing to do and that conversation is completely lost and so people people kind of people have become more and more just out for themselves it's like I can do whatever I can, even if, you know, even if you look at a very unsuccessful CEO of a massive company, you know, who's getting fired for a job because his, his company is, you know, laying off people and doing really poorly. And yet his, his, um, you know, exit package includes a $50 million bonus, right? There should not be a law that says, Hey, unsuccessful CEOs should not be paid, but on an individual level, if you're a moral person who says, what about, what about this is right for me to take money for a job poorly done, you know, and, and there's no, that sort of that cultural reinforcement nor individual reinforcement of doing right by society. And that's where we're at right now. So that's why, so, and then other people look at it and say, well, if other people are going to live for themselves then I'm going to live for myself. So everybody's just sort of bumping into each other, living for themselves, trying to screw each other over. So so we don't really know what to sort of, who to answer to, what to do. And everybody's like, just get out of my way. It's like individual first. I don't know if I did the best job at explaining that, but. No, you did an amazing job there. You made me, I'm really glad you brought up that quote from Nietzsche because I've been looking into him a lot lately. And 
I think that's so relevant when you look at what's happening in, in these like big urban cities where there's a complete lack of common belief system. They've killed God. And so there's nothing holding the people together. And we like to think that we've got science now and we're really enlightened and we, you know, science has given us all this convenience and comfort, but you can't get your morals from science. You cannot get your principles from just dry facts. And I think that's what religion does. You know, there's good and bad with everything, but one thing that religion does is it tells you a, a code of morals to live by. And so when somebody falls in front of you and gets hurt, uh, you know, a religious text would say you get down and you help that person. So you know when that happens to do that. But if you don't have that core belief system, somebody falls down in front of you, you can kind of just look at them and say, oh, that's not my problem. You know, they're, if I help them, what would happen to me? You know, like it reminds me of uh, the Good Samaritan idea and being a good neighbor. And, um, yeah, I look around cities now and I see like a lot of godless behavior, a lot of lack of morals. People are not, people don't say hello to each other. There's a lot of disconnection and you, you see it manifest in like people live impulsively. They go towards addiction and prostitution. And then on the uh, other side, you go to a, a temple or a very old ancient religious site and there's pristine gardens and it's quiet and it's been preserved for thousands of years and you think okay maybe there's something to this and there's a, a philosophical concept called a chesterton's fence chesterton's fence have you heard of this i have yeah well but, just but really please, quick it's be, it's yeah. like you come up on a fence and you don't know why it's there you shouldn't destroy that fence until you know its purpose. And that's kind of what religion is. Like we're, we're coming up to religion and we're saying, oh, let's just destroy it. Mm. But we don't really know what its purpose is fully. And it's been around for thousands of years. And it's, we need to be careful if we're just going to toss it out. Mm. I heard a quote, it's, there are two types of fools. Those who take religion literally and those who believe it has no value. Mm. So I kind of, that, that quote really resonated because I like that. I think you have to have your foot in both yes. realms. Yes, because on either side, there's a very dogmatic belief, you know, and I'm going to say something. I'm, I'm sure it's going to upset a lot of people, but, um, you know, with the decline of religion could have been so massively avoided too, but specifically Christianity in America. If Christians and Christian leaders were more willing to accept uh, people in in you know in the gay and lesbian community, and say to them, okay, this is you know sort of how you you were born, you were born, and instead of rejecting you and calling you immoral, and telling you you know you're going to burn in hell, which is to say no, you know, come into the community, be who you are, but live morally. Settle down with a person, adopt a child, or, you know, have a child via some other, you know, person, but live morally and live a nice, fulfilling life. Come, come be a Christian. Here's your path to being Christian. You know, and, and I know a lot of people that makes a lot of Christians unhappy, that idea, because they say, well, the Bible says this X, Y, and Z. There are a lot of things Bible, the Bible says that people don't want to live by. People kind of, it's like what you're saying is like you take it too literally, right? It's like the Bible also has its own limitations. It was written at certain times. And so there should be a willingness to understand when something is, is out of fashion but can be evolved to meet modern requirements. And what happened instead? So they rejected this, this huge community and told them that you are, no matter what, you're immoral. No matter what. And completely turned them away. Ostracized them completely. And... So they said, okay, well, if, if I'm immoral anyway, why should I live a normal life? You know, why should I try to engage with any of your rules? And they completely, they, they were completely cast out into the wild. And I think that's so damaging for society because we, at some point we had to reconcile with that fact is that some people are gay, some people are lesbian. You have to reconcile with that fact. 
and and that's the thing is that religion should should endeavor to be at the best version of people rather than this solid, overly solidified aspect. And same with, you know, I'm, I'm not Christian, I'm, I'm Hindu. It's the same with Hinduism too. Hinduism, you know, has made many attempts to reject a lot of things and, oh, women should do this and women should jump in the pyre of their dying husband. You know, there, there are a lot of limiting things that religion do. They have to evolve. And I think that's where we're kind of stuck is like the, you know, like all these old fashioned ideas that have persisted for thousands of years. You know, why is marriage good? All of these things, they're being upended today because everybody's like willing to question everything. Let's question everything. And the problem is that a lot of people don't know how to defend it. If, you know, it's like kind of like if a child keeps asking you why, 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 why this, why that, why do I have to eat this? Why do I have to do that? And then the parent just goes eventually because I said so, you know, and and that's sort of what society was trying to do is like, well, you, why, why should I get married? Everybody does it. Just do it. And so that those, I think we became too, we came, we, at, at a point that we're willing to question everything, we needed better answers. And I think that's what your channel and, you know, hopefully my channel we're trying to do is we're trying to answer these questions of, of sort of the old fashioned values, what value do they have to the individual today? Because they've persisted, not because it's some nefarious plot to control the individual. They've persisted because they're actually good for the individual. And understanding that so that people can understand why is marriage so good? Why is monogamy so good? You know, there's that, that whole idea of, no, you know, human beings are meant to be meant to be, uh, you know, polygamous and that selling monogamy, that's a very Judeo-Christian old fashioned way of controlling people, you know, that whole thing. And when that's not true at all, monogamy is actually so good for individuals and it's so good for children. And, and so understanding all of that and explaining all of that is, I think that's the, the way we move forward is, um, is a non is without relying on, well, because God said so. That's why you have to do it. Instead, actually giving a thoughtful action with a thoughtful answer without having to kind of jump it up to the big man in the sky uh, as, a, as, as to rely on his authority. Yeah, that's, that was beautifully put. And I've come around to see that monogamy is the best long-term strategy by far for raising families, for long-term mm. happiness, for living life. And it's the simplest for sure. Mm. Um, but I can see when you're young, it's hard to see that because yes. you want to experience everything. And you, you know, it, it's like if you're a prisoner in a cell, I, I'm like literally drawing this image right now. There's a prisoner <laughs> in a cell and he can reach for the keys to open the cell or he can reach for some food and get some food. And, you know, the prisoner's usually gonna reach for the food. Mm. Well, the, the image shows him reaching for the food because mm. it's like we wanna reach for that, that instant gratification, that pleasure, mm. rather than seeing, okay, what's good for the long term? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you're so, that's, you're absolutely right. And I think as when you're young, you know, you're impetuous enough that that's also important to kind of explore um, you don't know what you want. You're not crystallized yet. It's good to have a good dating history to try to see like, you know, what kind of person's going to gel with you. I, I'm very, uh, opposed to the idea of people getting married super young. I'm very opposed to that idea. I know that's uh, a lot of people feel like that's the, the good approach to marriage longevity. I think, I think instead in those cases, you can sometimes hit the jackpot and other times, you know, you're kind of 45 and you wake up and you, you know, have to upend your whole life to say, I have to get out of this relationship, which is very destructive. You know, divorce, I think, honestly, hell and divorce are pr pretty close together, the ideas of those two, two experiences. And I think it's good to experience and then at some point to say, okay, now to move forward and kind of evolve into who I'm going to be for the, for the long haul is to, is to settle down with a person. Yeah, I agree. Well said. Um, yeah, there's a couple other things I wanted to talk to you about. I think now would be a good time to talk about what is healthy 
masculinity and healthy femininity look like? You said femininity without struggling. I always struggle with that. Like That's femininity. A tough one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I even wrote it with just like nin, 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 nin. Okay. <laughs> just yeah. endless nininity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I uh, I think so this is what's really interesting, right? Because um with the way people think today, it's that if you if you give a pro proper definition to something, people are like, well, they'll think about the exceptions to that, right? So I want to talk about this on a general level because it's like that's one thing that's gone out of style is pointing out that what are men like and what are women like? It's like, well, some men can be like that and some women can be like that. It's like, yeah, with 8 billion people, there are always exceptions to everything, but there's a general ideas of, of and there are a lot of similarities between most men and a lot of similarities between most women, but there are always exceptions. Uh, I think positive feminine, uh, positive masculinity to me means a person that is is oriented towards protection you know who is strong you know because men are are uh born to be strong to be physically strong and i think psychologically for men engaging with physical strength is actually really good for them uh and and i think the trend of modern life that doesn't really reward physical strength is not it's not, that's not a good thing for men. I, and I think encouraging men to be strong, but also dangerous and capable of being dangerous, but then knowing how to be gentle, like that right balance of, of dangerous and gentle, which is why, you know, um, martial arts is like such an interesting endeavor for men is because they learn that discipline of how to be really, really strong, but how to apply that, that strength in the right frame of mind. And part of that, I think, is, is stoicism, which is so, I feel like it's such a misunderstood idea because people often look at stoicism like saying, oh, if you're stoic, you reject all emotion. You know, you, you uh, suppress all of your emotion. You don't feel anything. You don't have space to feel. And I think that's completely wrong. The, the tenant, sorry about the sound, the motorcycle sound, but the tenant, tenets of, of stoicism is to say, one of those is, is what you and I were talking about earlier, that you can't control what's going to happen to you. You can't control what the world is going to be like. What you can control is how you react to it and whether or not you allow your circumstances to destabilize your mind. And so the antithesis to stoicism is someone walking into a bar and the barman calls you ma'am but you identify as as not a ma'am and you get angry and you start throwing a fit and then you go online and start crying and and making a video complaining about how much that hurt to hear that that's the antithesis of stoicism and you have allowed someone else's actions to make you deeply unhappy and completely, completely upend you. And that's the point is that stoicism says that are you the master of your emotions or the, are the emotions the master of you? And I think that's a really important part of what it means to be a man because men often have to do go out and do sort of the harder, physically harder things. So a mastery of your emotions is really important versus let's say for a woman, which, you know, people might take take offense at that. But the reason it's so important with men is because men wield um, more dangerous physical power. So balance of mind is really important. If a man loses his cool, he can cause a lot of damage to the people around him. Uh, whereas a woman might just say things, right? But a man could actually like really hurt some people around him. And so that's why I think the stoicism aspect is so important to masculinity. And that his orientation, his like focus is about protecting the, should be about protecting the people around him, whether that's his, you know, wife and mother and, and father and daughter and son. And that's, what's really interesting. One of the things I was looking into was the st statistics of, around fatherlessness. And there's so much negative impact of the fatherlessness issue in our society. But one of the, one of the really sh shocking ones was that a, a, a daughter 
in a fatherless home is 900% more likely to be assaulted. And, and you know, my, my friend and I were talking about some, some random stuff. We were talking, and she, one of the things she pointed out, she was like, you know, when we were looking at all these Epstein things, all these flight logs and all this stuff going on, she said her father said the f- first thing the f- her father said was, where are the fathers of all those daughters? Like, why are those daughters, you know, all those little young girls, why are they in those situations? And that's the thing is like, you need a strong man to protect young girls from other nefarious men. You need a strong man paying attention to that. So um, I think that whole aspect of protection and children who come from homes where they feel protected is so crucial. And I think for young men, having a man um, model for them, the importance of positive masculinity is so important. Because for young men, they don't learn from moms, just like young girls don't learn femininity from dads. You know, you need it to be modeled for you to understand. And so that's why then, you know, it's important to have a coach or a teacher or someone, some male influence, positive male influence to tell you what's right, but also to keep you in check. Young boys, you know, test the boundaries of life and they need someone that can challenge them. A mother can't challenge them after a certain age, but a a father can forever if he's, if he's taking his responsibility seriously and tell and that's one that was a really good point that Larry Elder had made when he went on the breakfast breakfast club a couple of months ago he said you know i was never scared of the police what the police might do to me i was scared of what my father would do to me if i if i misbehaved and when you see the amount of youth out there you know you were mentioning kind of the city streets issues you see a lot of youth out there that's not afraid of the police they're not afraid of anybody and it's because the first person they needed to be afraid of was their father as the primary disciplinary disciplinarian so i think all of those aspects are really important about that go into masculinity that end up actually really holding society together that are really crucial and then should i move on to femininity or do you want to Um, pause here that was really beautifully said and it's yeah the masculinity issue is it has so many sides to it Um, yes and and you were saying that a lot of men find used to find their place in the world through physical means. You know, they pride themselves on being physically strong. And for thousands of years, that brought you a lot of value into the world or that that was your way of adding value to the world was your strength. And now we're living in this modern world where your physical strength and endurance and just like your your masculine power isn't isn't quite as useful and so yes. I, I think a lot of people are turning to like things like martial arts as an outlet for that. But still, it's not like you're going to be on the front lines doing jujitsu to defend your country. Right. It's it's a simulation of, of an ancient art. But um, there are less and less jobs that require that masculine um, physical strength. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that an important transition for men is to be there as spiritual protectors now. Yes. Yes. Um, it's, it's just as important as physical protection. And yeah, if you abandon your children, they're not going to have that spiritual protection or encouragement or guidance. And it, it makes sense. Some some of those statistics that you just said that without that spiritual protection, you could end up in some bad situations. It's a sad situation, especially in San Francisco, when you walk down any street and you see these people who are engaged in drug abuse and they're keeled over. And I look at them sometimes and I feel like, I mean, I I know this might make it sound like I'm trivializing the situation, but I often think in movies, I like make connections to certain scenes and like the emotional resonance of things kind of help stabilize accordingly to me. But I thought of them and thought about Gollum and how, you know, one of the things he says is that I forgot the feel of, of, of the wind. I forgot the taste of food. I forgot my own name. And that's what it seems like to me is that they're forgotten that they're human beings and they're willing to actually let themselves be in this very sort of 
disjointed, you know, non-human state. And a lot of that comes from feelings of abandonment of, you know, the statistics around, again, uh, youths that end up, uh, you know, engaged in drug abuse and running away from home and becoming homeless are pretty heavily tied to fatherless homes, pretty heavily. It's like 90% of youths that are on the street are, um, are come from, from fatherless homes. And the thing is that your mother can't abandon you. A mother might, but it's very rare because mothers have the biological attachment. We have the benefit of that. First of all, child is like literally part of your body. And, um, but there are also a lot of hormones and things that engage in bonding that are very, very strong. So it's, it's almost like a given that a mother is going to be there till the day you die, you know? Well, that's a weird way to say it when you mothers rarely see their children die. What am I saying? I I understand what you're saying. You understand what I'm saying. I'm losing my mind clearly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Mothers are there through the long haul, like you said, but a father has a choice whether or not to engage with his children and he can choose to walk away. And when a father chooses to walk away, it actually creates such a fracture for children, a feeling of abandonment, a feeling that they weren't good enough. And that's a, such a common thing, by the way, if you see, you know, in any TV show, there's so many instances of characters that the father wasn't in the picture and they have all these abandonment issues as a result. You know, uh, Barney from How I Met Your Mother is an example of that. You know, Schmidt from New Girl is an example of that. I mean, it's very common. And Barney, when he comes across his father and finds out that he actually has this family now and has a kid who he named after himself, you know, he, Barney feels so, he, he feels so terrible. He was like, why was, wasn't I enough for you to do that, for you to be there for me? And so this whole idea that, you know, it's totally fine if a child is raised by single mothers. And the reason people say that is because they don't want to hurt the feelings of single mothers. They're doing a very hard job, but it's actually so massive, such a massive problem. And, and then you see them then on the streets and you can understand why one of the, you know, one half of a very important partnership that needed to make them feel like they were good enough was missing from their lives. And, and they don't know how to, they don't know how to manage life without that. For a lot of people, you know, that's the, that's the unfortunate occurrence without a father. Mm. One of my most popular videos is how childhood trauma leads to addiction by Dr. Gabor Mate. Mm. And, um, yeah, essentially his, his theory boils down to um, from a young age, from the moment we're born, attachment is our number one need. If we don't stay attached to adults, we'll die. Mm. So we hold that over every other value. We need mm. to stay attached to adults. And we will suppress our authenticity to stay attached. And he says, anytime you suppress your authenticity is when you create trauma. And the mm. more you suppress your authenticity, the greater you will chase that feeling of attachment later in life. And things like heroin, I've never done it, but apparently it provides that exact feeling, almost that exact chemical concoction in the Mm. brain of that attachment feeling. So you see some of these addicts living in what looks like hell on earth, but they inject this drug and for however long, they are feeling like they're bathed in love. They're finally getting that hug from their parent that they've been longing for forever. So um, that, that theory me, seemed to that resonate makes me with a lot really of people. Sad. Yeah. That's really, really sad. Yeah. So that yeah, you sense. know, there's, uh, there's two ways to look at these people on the street. You know, a lot, a lot of people see them as a problem to be solved, but yeah. you can also look at them as they are just the products of this environment that they didn't choose. And, you know, if I was in that situation, would I be the same? Maybe, right. you know, probably. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in that way, you know, you have to really count blessings, right, that are given to us and, and that have helped prevent us from falling down that kind of path. But to say, oh, I would never do that, right? You know, but, but to say, like, no, there are, there are situations that you might do that, you know, or I might do that. So... Um, right. I feel, um, yeah, I feel really sad for those people because it is such a misunderstood problem, 
but it's also one that ha there's no sort of there's no adequate push to resolve at the moment unfortunately absolutely there's a youtube channel called uh channel five with andrew callahan i think and he okay. just did a uh, really good documentary about san francisco and uh -huh. um all the car break-ins hmm. i used to live there and my car got broken into six times when i lived there <laughs> oh, no. so this particular did they topic. break the tiny window or did they do other things just curious they pretty much broke every window okay including the front windshield at one point okay so okay. yeah that's, that's very thorough I experienced them all <laughs> oh my and god and so when i saw this topic i clicked on the video with mm. a lot of emotion like yeah we got to get rid of these these people mm. they're like parasites that are yeah, just yeah yeah going around causing chaos with no mm. ramifications they, they need to be stopped Mm. And he did such a great job reporting. He finally meets one of these guys that breaks into the cars and he follows him around for an entire day and gets to know him really well. And by the end, I'm feeling really bad for this guy. Like he has a kid that he hasn't seen and he wants to see him and he's, he's got no options. He's hooked on these fentanyl and he's been abandoned kind of, kind of like the typical tragic story. Mm. And by the end, you're like, my God, like, I could have been this guy if, if I was in that situation, you know, you, you can't, it's hard to judge at that point. Mm. Wow. Okay. I, I definitely need to watch that because, you know, yeah. I, I can have empathy and then there are moments of frustration where I kind of find myself completely outside of that and very angry. And I think I need to recalibrate a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's an idea that we don't have any free will mm. that I don't fully agree with, but it, there's yeah. a lot of logic to it mm. that, you know, we are products of our environment yeah. and all these variables go into everything is cause and effect. Right. And I think the value in, in seeing that argument, though, is that you don't hold blame on people as much as you would if you didn't know that idea. Because when you see somebody commit an atrocity, you can kind of see, all right, at one, pro at one point, this person was a baby mm. and they just got fumbled around in the wrong way. Mm. And you, you don't, you don't hold that resentment in your heart towards them. Yeah. If you know that idea. Yeah. Of course, there are lines that you have to set and there are boundaries yes. that have to be drawn. So you can't just be indifferent on everything. Right. But I think it's helpful to have that idea in your mind as well. Yeah, you you know that completely makes sense because it's not like they got, they have no free will, but there is in, they need to have some level of positive influence to at least help them see what's a good path for them of how they can create a better life. But if they never get that opportunity, how could they see? It's not like we're born with any kind of inherent understanding of good. We we have we have some level of where we can gauge oh, this is a good thing to do and this is not. But it takes a lot of thought and, and sort of exploration to get to that. It's not kind of built in. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I guess we should probably round this segment out with the feminine, femininity side. Yes, So what Let's does do it. positive femininity look like? So I think femininity is not about physical strength. That's not to say that some women aren't physically strong and if, if that's what they are interested in. I think femininity is about um, a different sort of emotional and mental strength. It takes a lot to, first of all, walk around as a, as a sort of a weaker, weaker part of society. Uh, in a lot of ways, if... I'm just going about my day. Uh, I have to make sure I'm thinking about where I might be putting myself at risk. And I have, I have responsibility to myself and my loved ones to make sure that I don't put myself in situations where I'm at risk. And in those cases, it's, it is this weird um, relationship that every woman has with men where a man at, on an empty street, dark street, could be your perpetrator or your savior. It could be either. You know, you, you don't know. You might either be really happy to see him or really sad to see him. And I think that one of those 
important aspects of, of being a woman is to be very responsible. And the, I mean, and this is one of those things that women, women, modern women really hate this idea, but there's a reason why women mature faster is because we, first of all, puberty for women, it means we are inundated with a lot of negative emotion, which I, I recall that moment. And suddenly I went from being a very happy child to very sad all the time. And, you know, we had our, we have our initiation into womanhood that men don't have, you know, we, we know when we're suddenly women, we have, we actually have a very strong bookend for that, or sorry, like, I guess not a bookend, but, um, transition for that. And, uh, that means suddenly you're looked at differently. You have to behave differently. You have to, you have to be a lot more thoughtful in how you're presenting yourself to the world. And. Uh, I think part of that is also then how you engage with men and how you allow men to look at you. This is something I feel very strongly about, but I think about it's very important for positive femininity to be about imposing lines on uh, with how, like boundaries around how men engage with you and and converse with you, relate to, with you. Um, and you know, this was something that when I was growing up, it was a good thing I'd grown up on books like Pride and Prejudice and, you know, Emily Bronte's books. Like I, I had, I grew up on kind of very old fashioned perspectives on, on the feminine. And when I got to college and every man thought that it was perfectly acceptable to get my affection or my time by just sending me a you up text was so angering that that's what passed as as modern romance and I found it so deeply offensive that that it was perfectly acceptable that a man could look at me like a commodity that he could get at the end of the night um just by send you know either buying me a drink or sending me something like that and I think forget about what anybody thinks on an individual level, as a woman, you will live a much better life if you have a strong control on how people, how pe how much people sexualize and commodify you. And, um, you know, and this is something I could talk about honestly, endlessly. But the 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 biggest difference, the bi biggest impact is kind of how how if if you set a boundary on how other people treat you, you also end up really ensuring that you you treat yourself properly, that you respect yourself. It's really easy. Again, coming back to that, like people kind of rushing to whatever is easy today. It's really easy for me to monetize myself on my body. I could start an OnlyFans tomorrow. I have a YouTube channel. I could tell them, hey, I'm starting an OnlyFans and I could be making money. I'm, I mean, I'm like whatever looking, whatever. But I could do that because it's really easy for a woman to make money by commodifying herself. But does that mean that you're going to be endlessly happy Is that and respect yourself and have healthy relationships with the opposite sex or your children or your parents? Absolutely not. It's because you are telling someone else that they can buy your body and that's how, that's how the world is going to treat you. They're going to treat your body like a commodity. So I think that sort of conservative approach to how you let the world talk to you is really, really healthy for, on an individual level for a woman. And then the other aspect of it is like, what's your responsibility to the opposite sex? Let's say your husband um, or your, you know, your, your male partner, specifically we're talking about men and women here. Um, I think men, unfortunately, don't have a lot of opportunity to have an outlet for their emotion. Um, I think partly it's societal and partly I think it's just how men sort of prefer to be. And I think being that sort of sort of creating that space for your husband or your boyfriend or whoever to have an outlet and talk to you and share with you sort of all of their insecurities um, and fears and and giving them that opportunity to do so without having ramifications or like you know reputation issues or punishing them is really important because we women are really good at that and this is something I didn't really realize until until I was married. So I, I, I you know, I'm, I have a brother, but I honestly didn't understand this until I got married. 
was that, you know, my husband talks to his father about his issues or he talks to me, but that's, but that's it. I talk to my husband. I talk to my dad. I talk to my mom. I talk to my brother. I talk to my sister-in-law. I talk to my friend. I talk to my other friend. I talk to my other friend. I have endless sources of places where I actually have an outlet for my emotions and my issues and all of that. And everybody, you know, receives it and says, go, go ahead. You cry, you feel it, all of that. And I noticed that with my husband, he, he doesn't have a lot of those. Like he's not, he's not even willing to do that, but it's like, he actually doesn't have adequate outlets for that. And that's one, one of those aspects I think is really important is that if men are going to be those like spiritual protectors, like you were talking about, and I love that idea, that concept of spiritual protector, that's so important that they also need to have a place where they can be weak and have an outlet for that emotion. And I think, um, that's really important for women to do that. And, um, you know, modern women hate it being told, like, we need to do this for our husbands. Like, it's like, it's like, you know, you, this absolutely loathsome idea to say to a woman these days, but just like men owe women things. And for us to say, oh, a husband should endeavor to do this for his wife. That's a good thing. We say, oh, that's a good thing. Yes. Husbands should do things for their wives. But that's the same thing is that, you know, we women have responsibilities as well. And I think our emotional intelligence is our greatest strength, our ability to, to comfort, to care for. I mean, that we should not, we should not reject those ideas. That's, that's our greatest strength. The whole, the whole foundation of family is built on a woman that's willing to build a good family, but the protection and safety and ultimate success of the family is based on a husband and his willingness to protect his family. And I think in that way is where you, you partner up and create this really strong um, connection between the best of both sexes for, you know, ultimate success. That was beautifully put. You, you, uh, you keep giving me a lot to think about, and I'm taking notes here. Um, I did a video this summer to try to clarify sex and gender. Mm. It was a big video and I knew That's it was going to be risky to make, but we, I worked with uh, Heather Hying and Brett Weinstein on oh, it. Oh, what a, what, I mean, what a great and partnership there. So they look at this entire issue from a evolutionary biology lens. And it was really interesting to, to just look at it through that lens. But when you take it down to like the sperm and the egg, you have thousands and thousands of sperm competing for that one egg. And that translates to our behavior in the real world. Men typically are more focused on what happens before reproduction, whereas women are more focused on what happens after reproduction because they have to take care of the child. Whereas men, so, so you typically see men competing a lot more and they're fighting with, with each other for a mate. And it is the woman's job to be a filter and to, to be selective. And I think that manifests in what we value in men and women. Like we, it's really seen as valuable for a man to be able to provide. Um, cause that sets him competitively, that sets him out from the herd. And it also shows that he could be an asset after the child is born. He can create a stable environment for that child down the road. Whereas what men value in women is fertility, but also a, a big thing that you were speaking on that often gets overlooked is the ability to be selective, the ability to be that filter, which is the ability, the ability to set boundaries and say no. And so if a woman shows that she's able to say no, her value goes way up in the eyes of men. And yes, that, that OnlyFans life is very alluring. It's right there. It's that instant gratification. And it's, it can be hard to say no to it. But the second you do that, you completely lose that filter, that yeah. value. And you can never get it back. Mm -mm. Yeah, which is something, you know, feminism is trying to change that. So fourth wave feminism, I think we're evolving past fourth wave and into fifth wave. I don't know when they'll oh make boy. that declaration. 
but I think you know fourth wave was all about sort of DVI, DEI and and um, actual like I think at fourth wave they've achieved a lot of success by actually infiltrating HR departments and writer rooms and they you know that they've gotten some level of critical critical mass but fifth wave if we could make that argument that we're entering that is um why did i lose my train of thought fifth wave like at, at fifth wave do we even have women anymore or is that concept just become relative yeah no that i think so the whole uh, breakdown of the definition of woman really happened at the third wave uh but we didn't hear about it until the fourth wave because the the whole third wave uh was based on intersectionality as well as um this book that judith butler i always find it hard to say her name but judith butler who is a who is a professor at uc berkeley uh wrote this book called gender trouble where she um sort of brought to popularity the concept of uh gender roles you know being something that you could jump between sorry um gender and sex being something you could jump between that it could and you know she her she ident and identifies as non-binary so prefers to go by they so it really got introduced then but what was the thing you said sorry what was the last thing you had said right before um was it about fifth wave and how we're just going to get so relative that we're going to lose the definitions of everything? Um, but right before that, what was like the point? Um, so you, I was you talking said, about women are the filter. Oh, and only fans. Yes. Okay. So now I caught it. Sorry. Uh, that fifth wave is going to, is really going to be about, um, finalizing this concept that sex work is just regular work. Um, and that commodifying of the, of the body is totally fine. And I think part of that is already in motion. Uh, there's a lot of push for the destigmatization of adult industry work because women are the ones, you know, they say that suffer the consequences for that for good reasons, as you've explained. And I completely agree with all of those, which is that it's, you know, a, a filtration system for a woman is far more important than for a man. And um, that's the big push that women are suffering for having to engage with the adult industry because you know due to uh, limited economic issues you know resources that a woman might turn to something like only fans and then she's ostracized for the rest of her life and that should not be allowed why why is it that men are not and and when men are the main consumers of something like that why is that not um why is that not forgiven for women or even not even considered for women and the other thing that's going to happen is going to be the um, overhauling of woman, you know, that idea of woman bearing children. I think that's going to be the next push is going to be that, oh, well, we should just be relying on science to bear children and that even um, a, a surrogate is totally fine. That's going to be the next push policy wise, which in America is a lot more lenient, but in other countries, it's considered pretty a uh, pretty difficult thing to accept because what you're doing through surrogacy, and this is something Louise Perry talks a lot about, um, that she talks about how, you know, you're intentionally breaking a very important bond between mother and child. And I'm sure Gabor Mate would have a lot to say about that as well, because, you know, that, that there's a lot of trauma attached to that because, you know, the baby, the first heartbeat that he or she hears is the mother's heartbeat, the smell. I mean, the baby doesn't even, for the first couple, for a long time, doesn't even feel like they're apart from the mother, right? Even after being born, they feel like the mother's body is their body. It's like a very deep connection that you intentionally break through surrogacy. So I think there's a lot of moral questions um, that people are going to try to raise that, you know, the next wave of feminism is going to say, no, well, you know, it's totally fine to farm out someone, uh, some other woman's body for, for my particular needs or your particular needs that should be totally okay and considered a regular transaction. And that's, that's really what is we're looking at is the general commodification of the female body. Um, and, and, and that being totally okay. Well, yeah, if we're going to take it to, the future trajectory. Yeah. I think we're not that far away from AI porn and things like that. So Yeah. It'll Yeah, the 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 competition maybe with these AI porn bots 
Hmm. And that's going to be hard to compete with because those things are going to have no taboos. Right. Those things will be able to go to the wildest fantasy and beyond. Yeah. And I don't think any human will be able to compete with that. Mm -mm. So perhaps we're going to go so full cycle. We're going to go all the way around where, you know, every sex work is going to be incentivized and then it's going to be just like, we can't compete with these AI bots. Let's just go back to having like peaceful, civil romance or yeah. something. On Hopefully, a farm. if I'm being optimistic, maybe it'll <laughs> yeah. just get so chaotic that people mm. are like, I'm done with this. I'm getting yes. off this train. Yeah. I I actually think that, I don't think we're headed in a, into a dark future. I think things are really dark now and are likely to be for a little bit, but I don't think our future is dark. I think, uh, I think we are in a very... Um, difficult transition period where we've lost that like i was saying that that um man in the sky to tell us what to do and we've overextended individual freedom so much that we feel completely spiritually lost and now i think it's going to be about bringing things back together hopefully but without reliance on on because god said so but instead because this is what's good for everybody I think we're going to build a new morality system is what I think is going to happen because it's kind of already happening. Um, you know, the idea that porn is bad for you, if if you said that five years ago or 10 years ago, people would be like, shut up, who cares? You know, no, it's not. And now um, that actually that idea is, is is taking hold. People are understanding why porn is so bad for you. And uh, many people are, are choosing to stay away from it, completely stay away from it. Uh, same with alcohol, same with um, um, birth control. You know, birth control is just considered this magic thing. And now there's so much awareness being spread that birth control is actually devastating to your homo hormones and that you should absolutely get away from it. And many people are resentful that their doctors, their primary care, Physicians didn't warn them about the side effects that they could expect because a lot of people, women felt suicidal on it, emotional on it, still do. Um, and and then the impact on it later is is after once once you get off of it is also pretty pretty big. But again, people like Andrew Huberman, are, you know, is, is shedding a lot of light on stuff like that. So I think we're and and even fatherlessness now that's like a big conversation that we're having, right? I think it's all sort of gone from research to entering the the general uh, conversation and now it's just going to spread from here and there's this whole f slice of society that's so intent upon making themselves as great as possible and i think they watch your channels like yours they watch channels like chris williamson like and andrew huberman brett weinstein jordan peterson and they they are intent upon building a good life for themselves that's you know without caffeine or like full of workouts and and you know thinking about their problems and not you know suppressing them it's like all these great things and then also understanding their moral code or understanding the value of religion i mean how many people watched jordan peterson's lecture on on genesis and then his seminar on on exodus I mean, people are engaging that without being religious themselves. And they're seeing that kind of like the Chesterton's fence thing is that, you know, religion has its values. You don't have to turn into a dogmatic, you know, person who's going and looking down at everybody for for believing certain, not, belie not believing certain ideas, which is what religion really turned into for a lot of people, is that it became this tool for their ego and to beat down on other people and tell them they're going to hell. But no, religion has individual value. That's so, that's so wonderful. And I think it's all about taking the ego out of it. And I think that's going to be the new form of morality that's going to burgeon up. It's going to be an intellectual morality. And, um, and, and so I, I'm very hopeful that a lot of things are going to turn around. Mm, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. I, I, I love what you just said. And I think we've now had enough time to see the second order effects of a lot of things that we thought were like the solutions, the be all end all solutions. And now mm. we're saying, okay, 
20 years later, what's the second order effects of all these antidepressants we've given everybody? Yeah. What's the second order effects of all the ADHD medication we've given out? Birth control. Um, you know, we're now starting to see, oh, wow, there, you know, you, there's no, no such thing as a free lunch. We, no. There's, there's an impact. There's unintended consequences to everything. So unfortunately, we're still doing things right now where we're going to see down the line the second order effects. But I think a lot of people that are optimistic enough to be parents in this modern world are going to have the tools now to teach their kids about second order effects instead of saying, hey, no, you can't do that. Mm. Hey, don't watch porn mm. no matter what. You're not allowed to. And they say, why? And you're like, I, I don't know. It's bad. Mm. Instead of saying that, you could lay out a path and say, look, down the line, this is how it affects you. And this is how it'll derail your entire life. So mm. it depends on what you want. If you want a family and a successful career and to be fit, you can't get derailed in this way. Yeah. But if your goal is just to be derailed or if you don't have a goal, then by all means, go down these impulsive paths. Yes. But I think it's having the ability to lay that out for a next generation is really important so that they have like a, a healthy compass of the world. Because like in Genesis, the first one of the first stories, it is human nature to want to do what we're not allowed to. That's like the first thing humans want to do. God mm. puts Adam and Eve on earth and says, don't eat that fruit. First thing they're going to do is eat it. That. So, <laughs> right. you know, maybe if he explained what happens if you eat it, mm. they would have chosen differently. Yeah, yeah. And my husband and I were talking about that because he recently gave up alcohol. <clears throat> I say recently, but it's been more than a year. And it's funny because every time he tells people that he gave up alcohol, uh, people will say, well, were you an alcoholic? You know, it's like they assume that you had this major problem and that's why you had to give it up when he just realized, like, I just didn't feel good with it. And and one of the things he was thinking about is like, oh, when, when we have kids, at least I feel more now emboldened and empowered with with information to say why you should not drink alcohol or have a healthy relationship with it at least but that when he was growing up it was just like because i said so and same with me and the ideas around modesty um i grew up in a very modest household i grew up you know and i took to it i i wasn't really rebellious about it i actually felt like it actually felt kind of natural to me to be modest and but as i grew up it started to make sense to me. And I, of course, tested a lot of the theories out when I was in college because I did want to have my rebellious time. But I had to like stumble into the understanding of why me treating my body as something that was sacred was important for my mental health and for me to actually have a very successful relationship then in the future with whoever I ended up with for forever is that then he also knew that I had treated my body as very sacred and wasn't... So it, it was... It took time to understand that. And now, and, and now, you know, you have writers like Louis, Louise Perry explaining the ideas of why modesty is so important, or, you know, you shouldn't get drunk around, you know, these, in these like frat parties of, because of what kind of impact that might have on you. And she does it all without lending to religion at all. And, and if she had, you know, I, I don't think it's wrong to rely on religion, but I think people feel like religion is an incomplete answer to them. And so it's like she's instead explaining like the full path of it and bringing it back to the individual. It's like what exactly happens, you know, if you if you engage in, in one path versus another. And I think we're just getting those like very detailed answers to things. Yeah, we're, we're very lucky right now where we're living in this age of we have so much access to information. Yes. You know, I'm so grateful to people like Jordan Peterson who are taking all these incredible philosophers and old texts and he's yes. filtering it down into such an easy way to understand. And, it's and same with of, religious texts too. Yeah. yeah. It's because of Jordan Peterson that I've looked into Carl Jung and Viktor mm. Frankl and all these other philosophers that, he, you know, you hear him mention a name enough times, you're like, okay, I should probably check out that book. Yeah. And it's, He's really been like, well, I guess you could bring it down to like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan led me to him. And then he led me to like 20 other great philosophers. And I keep going down this rabbit hole. And now I'm mm. like getting into these very obscure, ancient occult type things. And I'm like, wow, how oh, did I get here? Yeah. Okay. 
is this an okay time for me to tell you about Vipassana? Um, do you want to sure. do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Because I think I, I think it it's a good wrap on everything as well. So, um, I I've told you this, but I at the end of last year went for a ten day silent retreat. It's called Vipassana, where um, you live like a monk for ten days. You don't. Um, in, you have certain precepts, like morality precepts that you have to follow. For example, you don't engage in misconduct. You don't lie. For those 10 days, you're sort of taking this oath. You don't kill anything. So even if there's an insect in your room, they have like a little way for you to take it out so you don't kill the insects. You're eating vegetarian food. Um, but specifically, it's through this organization called, uh, It's maybe it's called just Dhamma, D-H-A-M-M-A. -M -M -A. And... It follows, it follows the precepts set by Buddhism, like Buddha specifically from, you know, centuries ago. And Buddha himself discovered this practice when he was meditating and he discovered it based on ancient Indian texts that were sort of lost. So he rediscovered this technique and then he crystallized it into this method of 10 days of, of meditation that help you achieve, start to achieve sort of an understanding of your path to enlightenment. And my friend convinced me to do this. I was very, very skeptical. Uh, she's been trying to convince me for 10 years, but the idea of being in silence and without any access to you know, my material world felt very frightening to me. And I'm so glad I, I went. She finally convinced me and I went. And the, the whole idea is that it's actually completely free. And they don't even let you donate before you take a course so that's actually part of, of of the mechanism to get you into the right mindset which is that you are here with all this room and board and 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 food that's being served to you is you're here on the uh, by the grace of other people's charity other ex-students have paid for for your ability to be here and that alone that's that begins that sort of humility practice to help you recognize that you need to, um, that maybe this is a good time to sort of rethink your approach to life. Because, you know, modern life, we're relying on ourselves. We go out and about, like, I pay for my lunch. You know, I'm, I've been relying on myself for, for, you know, better part of, you know, 20 years, whatever. So to suddenly be there on someone else's charity felt very strange, but that's how monks and nuns live, right? And that's what you're engaging in. You're engaging in the very simple life. And you're not allowed to talk to anybody. You can't look at anybody in the eye. Everything's kind of set up as like a self-service situation. And the men and women are completely separated um, so that you're not distractions to each other. And then the primary thing you're doing is that you're meditating pretty much for most of the day. It's like 10 hours of meditation a day. And you learn a specific meditation technique. So... Even though you're not allowed to talk to anybody, they do have a discourse where the teacher teaches you about the system of me meditation and why it's important. So you're kind of learning the tenets of, of, of Dhamma. And it's a non-religious, uh, completely, you know, completely sort of secular, universal ideas that they talk about. And they, all, they talk about the, the kind of what is, what is the cause of everyone's misery. And, you know, this is something Buddhists talk about all the time, which is attachment. But specifically, what they talk about is this, we're caught in the cycle of craving and aversions. And this was something that was really important for me, because I'm actually prone to this massive iPhone addiction. I mean, it, it was bad. And that was something I realized that every time through this practice, every time I was, you know, writing a video for my for, for my channel and I would run into something difficult some difficult part I didn't know what to write as the next sentence immediately pick up the phone right it's because I had an aversion f felt terrible had a craving to stop the aversion pick up the phone phone is a distraction you know and that's sort of how I've been living my life for some time now of just using my phone as a distraction and what's amazing about Vipassana is that you have nowhere to run you are meditating, you're going inward. 
you don't have anyone to talk to, you don't have any distractions of modern life like your phone, like your computer, but you don't even have an occupation. You don't even have a job to keep you mentally busy. You just have to reconcile with yourself. And that whole forced process of that you're just sitting with yourself um, is so, it's, it's really difficult. It's extremely difficult. It was like way too much time to spend with myself. But the learnings out of it are so incredible. And then what you start to notice through the Vipassana practice of the specific type of meditation, which I won't get into here, but um, it actually starts getting all of your, all those things that you've been running from, it allows it to come out. It allows it to surface. And it'll surface either as a thought or as a f sensation on your body or emotion. And uh, they, warn, they warn you that specific days tend to be really difficult for people. And fifth day was the first day that I noticed that a lot of people were crying around me. And even I was very emotional. It's like stuff just, it's just, there's been enough time that you've been sitting in silence that stuff starts to really come out. And that's what the whole practice is really about, is just try to recognize the misery cycle that people tend to keep themselves in and how to release themselves from it. And it was the most transformative experience of my life. It's something, you know, I, I know you're curious about it. I would highly, highly recommend. But that's also why I wanted to bring it up here in case this is something that um, is interesting to other people. They should definitely check it out because I think it's very easy. We live in a world where we can get every one of our sort of immediate needs met, sort of what you've, you've been talking about, this, you know, the the, the sketch you were talking about. So it's a very hard to meet our, it, it's very easy to meet our basic needs. It's our spiritual needs that go completely ignored. And uh, this was a great opportunity to sort of reset my priorities. Like one of the things I noticed is that I, I love my family, I love my husband, I love my friends. And mentally I was deprioritizing them over my phone. That like there was a part of me that was irritated if someone was talking to me because that meant I wasn't on my phone. I mean, that's how bad my addiction was. I mean, it's really embarrassing to even say it. But um, this thing completely helped me see that. And I felt that ache that that's what I was doing in my life. And, um, and so it helps you sort of reset a lot of things to actually understand what your real priorities are. That sounds amazing. Wow. So that was 10 days? 10 days. How did it seem like 10 days or did it seem longer? Or? It seemed longer. Definitely seemed longer. Um, and uh, I think the first couple of days like passed glacially slow because the, the meditation periods, you know, are really long. And then it changes your perception of time. You know, suddenly sitting because you meditate for one hour at a time, just just about. And that first couple of sessions felt so long and then slowly you're like oh a one hour meditation doesn't sound that bad you know anymore and um and now we keep up the practice you have to you know if you want to continue to engage with it it's up to you but you you keep up a, a daily practice of it as well um but yeah it did feel incredibly long and then especially at the end because right? one of the things i just really struggled with was just missing company it's like i'm really lonely and so i got to i think by day nine i just started started to really like come on we're almost there almost there wow so have you had enough time to process the experience like ha have you changed yes i have i think i think there were a lot of ideas if if you go let's say i think what you might find is that there are a lot of ideas that aren't really new to you you've been circling around them you know in your in your intellectual endeavors just like because you know that's how i felt because i think they're all ideas that that makes sense on a universal level, whether it's stoicism telling you about it or Jordan Peterson talking about it or Carl Jung talking about it. There are a lot of similarities in, the, in that understanding. But there was one final piece that felt like it was missing, where I was like circling around the ideas, but that didn't mean that uh, it had internalized quite. So um, as part of this, this philosophy, you know, the teachings of Dhamma, one of the things he talks about is that there are three types of the main teacher. His name is Goenka, who has passed on now, but there are recordings of him where he, he, he just gives the lesson. Um, and one of the things he talks about is that there are three different types of um, wisdom. One is you hear someone else give you a piece of wisdom. 
Another is that you yourself understand it, where you can intellectually un completely understand it uh, and relate it to other people. But then there's a third piece of wisdom where you feel it. And he gave the example of, of medicine, that if a doctor tells you, oh, you're sick, you need to take this medicine. And you say, oh, that's great, doctor, thank you for this medicine. That's you recognizing this other person giving you this piece of wisdom. You can go and possess the medicine. That's you understanding it. You go, went to the pharmacy and filled the, your prescription. But until you take it, it's not going to help you. And that was the piece that I felt was missing, where I, you know, one of the things that's due to the difficulties of the last couple of years, my, it's, it's really taken a toll on my body. So for, you know, for about a year ago, I just came out of this period where I had a lot, had like massive hair fall, like massive hair fall. And um, I also developed a chronic health issue in that, in that period. So it was like, I understood the ideas that people were telling me intellectually, but I hadn't quite internalized it where it wasn't being all these issues and miseries of my life were still being stored in my body and were still taking a toll on me mentally and physically and spiritually. And this, this going to this helped take me to that finish line where I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm fixed or anything like that, but at least understanding the principle of how to help myself and how to engage with, 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 with my issues. That was, that was extremely, extremely necessary. That's incredible. Well, I, it sounds like a, an experience I could benefit greatly from. I'm, I'm, you're not going to change too much though, right? <laughs> you're still going to get your channel, right? <laughs> I might become too Zen and just float out of here. <laughs> do, do you think this is going to inform your future content? Are you going to take it in a different direction? Yes, I think so. I think, you know, one of the conversations you and I had had last time, uh, like I was telling you, the, you know, you've inspired me to be less sort of attacky about things and more... Um, more sort of create positive visions for things. So, I, you know, you had you had taught, sort of told me about how you think about those things, and that was something I was taught, kind of mulling over in my my mind. And now I understood why that's so important for me to do that. Um, so I I don't want to be sitting and just bashing things. And it's okay, I think, to criticize stuff. I don't I don't think there's anything wrong at, at, with that. I think that's a necessary part of any dialogue. But to be constantly dunking on something is not something that I want to engage with. I think that that instead trying to spread as much positivity and love as possible is is really what what I kind of gleaned from from this experience. That's amazing. I think for the last couple of years the level of cynicism has been increasing, but I feel like it it might get to a breaking point where people are going to get keen to it and say I I'm done with this cynicism. Because mm. even even in our area, we're like critical drinker. Mm. He'll make a video about how horrible a movie is, and that will get three million views. Mm. And then he'll say, "Hey, this movie's pretty good," and that'll get like a couple hundred thousand views. Yeah. And even myself, like when I see he's like he says this movie really sucks, mm. I'm like, "Oh, this is gonna be a great review." Let's, yeah. Let's hear critical drinker just dunk on this movie. Yeah. But same same. No, that's fine. I I hope he keeps doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but because the movies do suck, they need to get dunked on. But yeah, someone has do, to dunk on them. Yeah, Come on. We, we definitely need, <laughs> and he like, does it so well. Yeah, we need a, a positive image of the future. We need a vision that we mm. can that gets us out of bed in the morning. And I was I just did a podcast about the pyramids in Egypt. Oh, wow. And one thing that's so special about them is they're so mysterious, mm. but when you see them, you realize that possibilities are endless. And you're looking at something that is impenetrable to time. Mm. And for one moment, you get a glimpse into this thing that is like eternal, and it makes you feel like you're part of this thing that's eternal. Mm. And that even though your physical body was going to go away, part of your essence can just like ripple on forever. And... Wow. When you're, it's easy when you're in this matrix world where everything's so temporary and the buildings are all concrete and glass and everything's put together so fast and carelessly. Mm. You kind of feel like you're just a cog in a machine 
you're just disposable. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I feel like the importance of getting outside of the matrix into these situations like what you just did or seeing the pyramids or just anything that takes you out of your normal state of consciousness. Yeah. Maybe it's psychedelics, who knows, can show you, can, can let you touch a different state and see time in a different way, see yourself in a different way and step outside yourself. So mm. yeah, it's very important to, to mix things up. Otherwise it's like Groundhog Day, same thing every day. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, especially true for SF is that it's very easy to distort your own reality and think that this is life. This is everything that's happening, the chaos that's happening on these city streets is life. And suddenly I found myself in these beautiful woods and it's snowing and there are deer about and woodpeckers in the trees and there are, you know, ducks in the pond. And I thought, wow, what, you know, I'm, I'm so wrapped up in a one type of existence that I, I can't, I can't even perceive anything else sometimes. So it's good to, just like you said, just good to break out of it. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think your phone addiction is that bad, actually, because when you were saying that, I was like, oh, boy, that's I do the same thing. <laughs> so, sometimes when somebody's talking to me while I'm, I've got my phone out, I'm like, all right, I just want to see this one more meme. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. It, it can get bad. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's um, it's designed to keep you hooked, you know. It's designed to keep you swiping forever. Yeah, I mean, I just got back from a trip and I had my, my phone on airplane mode. I didn't want to do the roaming. Oh. And so I, my mind was like, okay, well, you're going to be back in Wi-Fi pretty soon. You're getting closer to Wi-Fi. And I felt like my mind, I'm like, can you just enjoy what you're doing now instead of worrying about when you're going to get to that, like, I felt like a, a guy that was swimming through the ocean trying to get to an island. I was like, there's, there's Wi-Fi. It, okay. it was bad. Okay, I that so okay so as part of Vipassana they have you you know hand in your phone you can either leave it in your car or you leave it in a locker. And I found myself not missing the phone at all, because I'm on the phone even when I'm brushing my teeth. I mean it's like I said it's bad. Um, um, nothing you're saying is that bad. <laughs> I'm glad you're validating that other people are also there doing doing this along with me. Hopefully so. I'm not enabling you though. <laughs> no, I have changed. I, I'm I'm now reformed. Um, hopefully, it sticks. Is the question because you know it's like two week. We we're two weeks out of this, so. Um, but I did not miss the phone. But when it was time to get it again, I reached for it in this dark locker. It's just a single phone, and it honestly felt like I was reaching for the ring from Lord of the Rings. You know when Gandalf reaches down mm. for it. And I'm, I'm like, and it felt like hot in my hand. And I went to sit down because I was eating breakfast with my friend. She was, she's the one who had convinced me. So she was there. Finally, we could talk. And it was like I was talking to her, but like my attention mentally was on that phone. And and I thought, wow, it's so strange because then she got up, she left, and I turned it on, and I saw like my usual, you know, notifications, okay, text from mom and dad, like, okay, uh, check my, you know, Instagram real quick, check YouTube real quick, check Twitter real quick. And then I thought, really? Like, this is, this is, is the thing. Is? Yeah, but like, this is what all the consternation is about, just for those like four or five in things of engagement that then you just cycle between all day. For what? You know, and what satisfaction did that give you in that m moment? You got nothing out of that. You got not a damn thing, not as much a satisfaction as you had talking to your best friend over, you know, over breakfast a minute ago. And so the whole ride home, we had a long ride, so I had a long time to think about it. And I said, okay, it has to change. Like the relationship has to change. Like it has utility. It is a must in modern life, but you have to change that it should not be moving on your person at all times like again it's it's like the ring it's like the ring where when i'm walking around and i have my hand in my coat because it's sf so it's cold all the time my hand is around the phone you oh know like that like that level of engagement with it or if i'm around the house it's in my back pocket 
If I'm at my desk, it's sitting right here on the desk. If I'm standing in the kitchen, it's it's on the on the counter next to me. If I'm in the bathroom, it's in the bathroom with me. If I'm at, in my bedroom, it's on my side table. Why such an intense like it is it's like I'm attached to it. And and so I said, "Okay, no. It's going to live in the kitchen 24/7. It's not going to be here." next to you. If you need it, you can get up, use it in the kitchen, then you can leave it there and come back. And that has been the new system. So it's not allowed in the bathroom. It's not allowed in the bedroom, nowhere. It just lives in the kitchen. And that has been really, really good. I keep trying to break it, but I'm like, nope, don't forget. You know, I need to do it for 30 days and then it'll hopefully stick from there and I don't have to force it as much. Well, that's, yeah, that's a great insight that you tapped into and you're inspiring me. I should probably do the same thing. Uh, I might need the 10 day retreat to yeah. really like jolt me into it. Yeah. Uh, it's ironic because we're both uh, content creators or yeah. influencers or however you want to put it, but it's like we make our career online mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that we're spreading are awareness about your behavior, mm. which if you listen to us, you might get offline. So we're like, wait, 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 wait. Right. don't, don't, don't listen to us too much. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. I, oh, but I also think that, you know, when I was on the retreat, a lot of the time I actually was, uh, thinking about when, you know, when you have breaks and stuff and you're not, you're not like meditating. I was thinking about a lot of movie scenes. I was thinking about TV shows, certain quotes that were sticking out to me and uh, like even books, certain books. And I thought that's one thing I realized is that because of my phone addiction, I actually deprioritize all the things that I genuinely love. And I mentioned family and friends and my husband, but I actually even, even art, like sitting and watching Lord of the Rings felt, feels like, oh, it takes too much time out of the day, but me being on the phone for four hours, you know, not cumulative, uh, not um, all at once, but cumulatively throughout the day, yeah, I'm probably on the phone for four, four hours. So that's okay doing something that brings you no joy, but watching something really nice, or even a, you know, a YouTube video that you like, that you find informative, interesting, whatever, versus just mindlessly scrolling. And I think that was actually the big thing is that I'm still, you know, I'm still consuming things, but it's stuff, it's, it's just being about more mindful and what impact it has on me. Uh, I think that that was the shift, is that engaging, actually engaging with art uh, on a day-to-day -day basis versus scrolling Twitter where I ha I go through, you know, 15 different types of emotion in rapid succession in under a minute. You know, how, what does that really do for me? I'm outraged at this and excited by that and ambivalent to this. And what does that do for me versus sitting and watching something that I actually really like or find, find interesting? Mm. One of my favorite quotes is from Terrence McKenna. He says, if you don't have a plan, you become a part of somebody else's plan. Mm. And I think about that quote all the time. It's That's like nobody okay. wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm going to spend eight hours on my phone. Nobody does that. Right. But once you slip into a subconscious state, mm. which we operate on 95% of the time, your mind just reaches for those programs that are like deep grooves in your, your mind. Yeah. And like the more you do an action, the deeper the groove is going to be in your mind. It's like skiing down a, mm. a, a mountain. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's like such a deep program. Like there's certain apps on my phone that I go to all the time mm. and my, my finger will automatically scroll and search for that. If I move the app, I yeah. find my thumb like, wait, where'd that go? Mm. And I'll do it subconsciously. And then wait, you know, I'll do it without thinking. Yes. Or like I used to go to Facebook so much that I would get on the computer and then my fingers would just type in FAC. And I'm like, well, I don't even want to go to Facebook right now. Why am I doing this? Or even that moment where I, I'll like close the app only to reopen it and not even realize. Like I just closed it and I reopened it. And even the instinct that if, if my phone is on my desk, I will just instinctively, instinctively reach for it. And it, it is that that yeah like you're saying it has those groove marks right um it's built in after years and years and that's why that what what you learn at vipassana is that craving it's a craving and you have to meet it immediately um and so you just leap to meet it immediately so having that creating that disconnection and recognizing it's that 
It's just, it's that slight form of distance, space between the craving, craving coming up and you resolving it instead going, oh, look at that craving. I have a craving to be on my phone right now. Why? Okay, because I just reached something hard um, in, in the script, in, the, in my next video script that I don't know how to resolve and I feel inadequate. I feel like maybe I'm not good enough for this. Maybe I'm not good enough for, for what I'm trying to be. Maybe I'll never be good enough. Maybe I'll fail at this. Okay, so you're afraid. Let, you know, so just taking it, that's the weird thing about being a human being is that we're so fear-based, we're so anxiety-based, and we make these crazy leaps. You know, we make these crazy leaps of, of, of the small thing happens and it'll be like, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll die because of this. You know what I mean? It's like maybe psychologically I'm, I'm, I'm completely, completely, um, you know, at risk because of this. So it's very interesting. Then, then we have these tools to then distract us in the moment and keep us away from that, that, but it exists somewhere. It's always there. So it's better to address it rather than let it just, just let it hide from you. Oh yeah, that's very inspiring. You're, I'm, I'm definitely gonna make some changes after this conversation for sure. Oh, thank yeah. you, thank you for saying that. And yes, I think you'll find, I think you'll find the ten day retreat really helpful in doing it. If you know, if yeah, I'll send you, well, I'll send awesome. you some stuff about it after. Yeah, I'd love to check it out. Um, I'm clearly becoming a, a vipassana pusher. <laughs> well, I, I like it that it's not, it's not led by like a guru or something. Right. It's kind of just your all. own experience. Yeah. And they're like very anti-ego. It's a very anti-ego. Like anytime there's a, a group that's led by one individual who's got like all the answers, I'm always like, mm, I'm not really into cults. You mm. know, like that's not my thing. Yeah. But this sounds like a very personal journey, which I've, I've always been drawn towards with those experiences. Like, Mm -hmm. sensory deprivation tank or a psychedelic journey or something like that. Th yeah. Those have kind of sparked my interest more because it's like, I don't know, you're just grappling with your own inner journey. Mm, exactly. I think the, you know, microdosing around psychedelics is, is fascinating. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. That's something I've covered a lot on my channel. Um, yeah. But it's definitely not the be all end all cure. Right. Like people are, are going crazy with it now. Yeah, it's that I like, by the way, I like how you think in quotes, because I feel like I think in scenes in like movie scenes. I think you think in quotes and you come up with the best ones, they like the exact right quotes. But there's that 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 one, I think it's a Carl Jung quote that don't be careful of unearned wisdom. Am I am I right about that? I'll have to look into that one. That's a good okay. one. Be careful of unearned wisdom. Yeah, I, and I think it relates to this is that, you know, psychedelics is it, people think that it's an easy route to wisdom, but uh, it's really, it's really not. It's, yeah, it's, it's more about building on what you're already doing and like aiding that rather than suddenly catapulting you into massive realizations. 100%. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you. And I'm so excited for our collaboration to come out. When... Me too. When this podcast is out, it'll be out. So hopefully people love it. And if you want to check out Baggage Claim, it's one of the greatest channels on YouTube. I watch every video. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And this was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. I love talking to you. This was great. It was awesome. Okay, I'm going to end this transmission.